opportunity to come to several of the open classroom lectures throughout the academic year, um, which as a humanist, as someone who's been trained to analyze ideas, come up with new ideas, and not specifically hard data, I found to be quite enriching. Um, and I've also been convinced that one of one of the ways that we need to study the social, political, and economic issues facing the United States today is by connecting not only um, the data analysis, but also the cultural interpretation, right? So those two things, I think, should go together. And I'm going to try to convince you of this if this isn't already obvious to you, right? Um, so let me give you a more specific example. As I was preparing this presentation, November's guest lecturer, Carl Case, came to mind. Case, a co-founder of Case Schiller, an emeritus professor at Wesleyan, began his fascinating talk on the current issues facing the housing crisis by noting that housing is about people. This claim seems simple enough, right? Without demand, housing would not exist. I want to add to this equation that housing and the built environment in general, including residential and retail developments, is about the desires of people. It's about people and culture. My research shows that insofar as the future of the built environment depends on population growth, it also depends on the cultural preferences and aspirations of people who live in it and the professionals who design it. The nexus of culture and demographics is particularly relevant for the ways in which a growing Latino population in the United States is poised to affect housing and urban development nationwide in the coming decades. So this presentation examines the ways the Latino population has impacted the shape of American cities throughout the 20th and 21st century. Um, at the expense of place specifics, I will guide you through an overview of this process through various cities. Um, I begin with what is regarded as a radical era of Latinizing cities. I will then show, can you hear me okay? As I can. Okay. So, well, uh, I'm going to begin by giving you an overview of the radical Latinization of cities. I will then move on to show how a professional class of Latino professionals have transformed the barrio, the Latino enclave, into a lifestyle that's useful in urban policy, development, and marketing. I argue that, those, that though these professionals rhetorically celebrate the barrio, the architecture they envision is a sanitized and Hispanicized version of the barrio. Now, in public policy, the term Hispanic is widely used to encompass a wide range of Latin American groups. But in critical cultural discourse, Hispanic usually refers to a Spanish colonial past. Right? I'm using it in that sense. Um, as Latino urbanism enters a professional realm, limits to the Latinization of cities are revealed. To further explore these limits, I will turn our attention to San Antonio, Texas where a Latino urban culture confronts several challenges. Indeed, San Antonio shows that there are places where Latinization can occur and places where it cannot, where Latino culture is a threat to a dominant imaginary of what American <coughs> cities should look like. So to start, the Latinization of cities has a long history. One could start with the Mexican-owned, brightly colored houses peppering the Southwest landscape <coughs> since Spanish missionary days or even the 1920 and 1930 murals created by Diego Rivera, David Alfaro Siqueiros, and Jose Clemente Orozco in cities such as Detroit, San Francisco, and New York. However, radical Latinization becomes most apparent during the cultural upheaval of the 1960s and 70s, when Mexican immigrants, Chicanos, and Puerto Rican migrants living in cities across the United States created brightly colored public art embedded in barrio struggles over urban space, housing, education, employment, and healthcare. The fast growing population of Mexicans and Puerto Ricans added a plethora of iconographic representation and vivid colors to cities, 
and created a Latino visuality that was as much about the United States as it was about Mexico and other places in Latin America. With these visuals, Latino groups sought to express their presence in public space, a presence that was often curtailed by racist spatial segregation and dominant notions of culture. Youth activists in the 1960s and 70s, Chicano and Puerto Rican nationalist movements, were essential to this visual enterprise. They wrote political and cultural manifestos, such as the Chicano Plan de Aztlán and the Puerto Rican Young Lords Party 13 Point Program, which is a Marxist uh, document, that squarely identified the barrio as a crucial site of resistance and cultural empowerment. The cultural and political action these manifestos galvanized were quickly evident in the built environment. In the 1970s, Chicanos in the Logan Heights Barrio in San Diego, California, created large-scale public murals with civil rights, Mexican indigenous, and revolutionary visuals. These murals were meant to reclaim the urban space that Chicanos were displaced from by mid-century infrastructure projects. You see the freeway ramps here. By the late 70s and 80s, similar political gestures were evident in smaller cities, such as Santa Ana, California, and in New York City, where the Puerto Rican population was emerging as the largest Latino group. One of the most recognizable symbols of a radical Latino urban culture in um, New York City's virulent period of deindustrialization were casitas, which are to the right. Um, casitas are reminiscent of Puerto Rican rural houses that combine indigenous, African, and European architectural vernaculars. They have verandas, corrugated or pitched to roofs. They have vibrant colors, and some of them even have chickens roaming gardens. Uh, casitas have been compared to squatter settlements because their builders improve unused land for public uses and thus uphold a communal notion of property that is in contrast to a private notion of property. Urban planning historian Luisa Ponte Pares claims that casita is an architecture of resistance that challenges neglectful urban policies and private interests. As you can see, struggles between working class Latinos and government and private land interests translated into an urban culture that offered spatial and aesthetic <coughs> alternatives for underprivileged Latinos living in cities. The jarring differences in scale and aesthetics between the picturesque casita um, and surrounding brutal high-rise brick apartment buildings, which the image to the, well, my right shows here, and bold graphic murals surrounded by dilapidated walls created new spaces for community building and cultural pride. It is this cultural audacity that makes Latino urbanism radical and different from the urban status quo. This visual discordance continues today in the form of business facades and memorials, which you see here. The one to my right is in uh, LA, and the one to my left is in the Lower East Side in New York City. An inner city class-based radical Latino urbanism has evolved with the late 20th century geographic expansion of Latinos into suburbs and small scale residential areas. The 2000 census report on the increasing dispersal of Latinos from inner cities to outlying suburbs has led the Brookings Institution to claim that Latinos are becoming suburbanized. I'm not a demographer, but I put up some data that I found, um, and I want to draw your attention to the one that says suburban Latino population has grown and exceeded the central city Latino population by 18%, right? And also the last uh, data, which is the purchasing power of Latinos, is really crucial to the ways that Latinos are now impacting in American cities which is their purchasing power. By two, 2010, it's estimated at $1 trillion, which is going as three times as fast as the rest of the population. 
So um, this new geography has activated a new period of thought on the Latinization of cities. And here's a map that shows you where the Latino population is concentrated. <coughs> Some academics, like Mike Davis, claim that Latinos are part of an urban cultural revolution about to spread across the United States. In Barrio Urbanism, David Diaz takes this notion further and argues that vibrant barrios <coughs> have been historically neglected by urban design, more egregiously so by the popular new urbanism movement, which holds street life at the core of its design paradigm. Diaz suggests that urban design professionals must reassess their field's dismissive <coughs> attitude toward Latino urban culture or risk becoming irrelevant to a growing diverse American population. <coughs> Professional <coughs> Latino urbanists agree that a multicultural spin-off of new urbanism <coughs> is necessary, and so they advance a Latino new urbanism that harnesses Latino population growth <coughs> and purchasing power and celebrates Latino urban practices and cultural preferences. A list of Latino new urbanist advocates includes a wide range <coughs> of government officials and business people, including Oscar de la Hoya, which you might know as the boxing champion, but who is also the co-owner of Golden Boy Partners Real Estate Development Company. The most notable Latino new urbanists include Michael Mendez and Henry Cisneros. Michael Mendez became really famous for writing uh, his thesis at the Graduate School um, of Urban <coughs> Studies and Planning at MIT, which initiated Latino New Urbanism Movement. And Cisneros is, of course, more widely known. He um, is the former secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development and now executive chairman of the urban investment and building firm City View, which is located in San Antonio, Texas. Cisneros' book, um, published in 2006, co-authored with former HUD special assistant John Rosales, purports to be a leading resource for all knowledge concerning the Latino home buyer, a how-to for those in the building industry interested in profiting from Latino's much touted purchasing power. The book was published by Builder Books, which is a service of the National Association of Home Builders and sponsored by Freddie Mac, right, at that very special period. Principles of mixed use and affordable housing in their development. And that's an example of this. This is in Jamaica Plain. I wanted to include a photo of Boston um, in my slideshow. So um, I recently passed by, this is what it actually <coughs> looks like, and you can tell that the new urbanist development is much smaller than the public high-rise buildings right next to it. So new urbanism's aesthetics of equality has supporters across the political spectrum. <laughs> cities. In fact, research has shown that new urbanism's traditional architecture has limited social dividends. It has been unable to attract people of diverse incomes and backgrounds in suburban areas, and small new urbanist public housing complexes often displace people from their communities and neighborhoods. Critics also express a ease with the movement's popularity. Scholar Paul L. Knox suggests that new urbanism has evolved into some form of religious fanaticism. Mike Davis has labeled it an architectural cult, and sociologist Richard Sennett calls it socially regressive because it emphasizes tradition as it withdraws from the, com from the complexity of cities. <coughs> Despite these criticisms, Latino new urbanists remain seduced by the barrio and maintain that it has much in common with new urbanism, and that this commonality must be recognized. Both new urbanism and the barrio are 
are characterized by stylistic diversity, compact, um, this is an example of stylistic diversity, um, compact mixed use space. This is a house that has four businesses on the bottom floor, and you can see how complex the visuals are. This is in Union City, New Jersey. Um, and it also has pedestrian activity and population density public transportation and susten sustainable practices. But I argue that in an effort to be commensurable with new urbanism, Latino new urbanists disregard the socioeconomic factors that structure the urban conditions of the barrio. For example, pedestrian activity and public transportation use may not be a choice, right? but a necessity brought about by unreliable and, un and expensive public transportation or the even more expensive private car commuting. Latino new urbanism also ignores the possibility that barrio residents may desire a so-called American dream of suburban normativity, free of any Latino cultural expression. Instead, Latino new urbanists hammer through their movement's agenda, thinking that Latinos will want to live in spatial configurations similar to the barrio as long as new developments are aesthetically appealing to traditional tastes. In this way, they imagine a Latino subject that is essentially urban and ready to urbanize places other than the barrio. Basically, in this view, Latinos want a spiced up but standardized new urbanism. According to Mendez and Cisneros, the key to making Latino new urbanism marketable to public officials industries and non-Latinos and Latino middle class home buyers lies in California mission styles or southwestern adobe designs or what the housing industry generally calls the Spanish style. In advocating for this colonial form of Latino representation, Latino new urbanism repackages the visual congestion found in barrios, right? All these various textures, <coughs> colors, and scales hand-painted color typography, murals and statues of the Virgin Mary, and revolutionary leaders, and a mixed use of construction materials into something that is more traditional and much more marketable, which is Spanish culture. Here are a few examples of developments inspired by and inspiring Latino New Urbanism. This is in Fruitvale, California. This in San Diego, and you can see that they tried to incorporate the murals that I first showed you under the radical Latinization of cities. Um, and this one is in Chicago, which is quite reminiscent of photographs that I've seen of old San Juan, um, if you've ever been there. Uh, so Latino new urbanism reproduces many of the pros and cons of new urbanism. Both movements advocate for affordability, both movements fetishize a city as an innovative and marketable unit, and both movements uphold the importance of neo-traditional design in the built environment to aestheticize the urbanisms that inspired them in the first place. In the past decade, the housing market, including the Building Industry Association of Southern California, welcomed Latino new urbanism for reasons having to do with expansive co-ownership policies enacted while Cisneros was at HUD and continued under Bush's ownership society. Right before the housing boom led to bust, the marketing possibilities of Latino urbanism were seriously considered. This excitement for Latino-inspired urban developments and the possibility of a profitable Latino consumer niche is also evident in commercial avenues and malls. Retail developers and city officials regard a growing Latino population and its purchasing power as a good opportunity to recover from the dying mall syndrome that has affected suburban areas since the 1980s. And this is one of the oldest examples of this. It's, in, it's constructed in 1989 in Santa Ana, California to revitalize a downtown. This is in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Uh, this is Fort Worth, Texas. So you can see it includes a lot of that Spanish architecture um, and also incorporates a lot of bright color. Um, well, let me stay here for a while. So these professional developments, malls, and Latino new urbanism 
represent the latest stage in the Latinization of cities. The professionals involved in these projects are visual brokers, <laughs> ready to make Latino urban culture profitable in the barrio and outside of it. I think it's important to understand that though Latino urban culture has entered this professional realm, there are still limits to the culture and geography of Latinizing cities. And so to those limits, I will now turn by focusing on bright colors. Brilliant color is often negatively attributed to a foreign Latin American menace or characterized as working class or excessive Latino culture. After overcrowding and parking violations, color ranks high as negative marker of Latinidad and non-assimilative Latino practices in cities. Here I focus in San Antonio, Texas, but this is also true in San Fernando near LA and in Toledo, Ohio, where brightly colored facades have triggered new zoning code regulations. Now in San Antonio, Texas, in May 1995, Mexican architect Ricardo Legoreta celebrated the unveiling of his new building for the San Antonio Public Library amid energizing cheers of Viva Legoreta. Yet for a month previous to opening day, the bright, almost neon orange red modern square with purple and yellow interiors was a subject of controversy. Debate stirred about the aesthetics and representational significance of the library's red facade. One former city council member declared, quote, I'm not too thrilled with enchilada red buildings. It just overshadows everything. The Spanish culture is beautiful, but sometimes you can go overboard. These people came to San Antonio to escape the Mexican influence, end quote. The council member's statement reveals that brilliant color, even when abstract and devoid of explicit working <coughs> class or immigrant references, is a blatant reminder of immigrants. Right? This color signifies unassimilated, unassimilated poor Mexican immigrants and, and is thus a threat to the Southwest's attachment to Spanish colonial culture. Other crude political color associations were made in a name that red color context, contest, sorry, that was thrown by a local newspaper. Submissions included bleeding heart liberal red <laughs> and dried blood of taxpayers squeezed till they bleed red. <laughs> Such entries could note a set of stereotypes about Latino US relations that characterize liberals as guilt stricken individuals who capitulate to unworthy multicultural public projects and identify Mexican immigrants as the exemplary leeches of public coffers. A color controversy, again in San Antonio, sparked in 1997, when the famous author Sandra Cisneros painted her Victorian cottage in a historic residential area of San Antonio of bright purple. The purple house was immediately deemed out of place and associated with the barrio. Members of the city's historic and design review commission thought it was historically inappropriate <coughs> and quote, too vivid and modern, end quote, for a neighborhood of 19th century Victorian mansions erected by wealthy German merchants. Magazine editorials agreed the house was out of place <coughs> and asked why Sandra had not simply moved into nearby La Vaca Barrio, where brightly colored homes are several and not contentious. Sandra, on the other hand, claimed that her individual color choice is part of American diversity and the region's history. After all, bright colors can be seen in barrios across Texas and the border. At a committee meeting, Sandra summarized the polemic by noting, quote, this is really a story about the absence of color, about the absence of Mexican people when you talk about history in this part of the world. We don't have beautiful showcase houses to tell the story of the class of people I come from. Our inheritance is our sense of color, end quote. In contrast to the controversy surrounding the brightly colored library and house, in 2007, the bright pink and yellow Museo Alameda, which is a Smithsonian partnership, opened without public debate, perhaps because it was located next to a bright green historic Mexican mercado, which is to my right. What I want to point to is that there's a culture place appropriateness at play in the Latinization of cities. For some, Latino culture, even abstract bright colors, undermine economic value and an American sense of place. 
and thus should be restricted to barrios. This desire to discipline Latino urban culture is evident in Latino new urbanism, but it is also seen when covenants and zoning codes kick in to regulate the more organic Latinization of cities. Lawyer and academic Stephen Bender suggestively claims that such cultural restrictions advance a new moment of spatial segregation. So to wrap up, um, a new Latino geography is in the making, and culture will be at the core of how this is received by a wide range of Americans. This geography raises questions for American urbanism in general. What is the role of culture in the rapid urbanization of the United States? Should architecture promote aesthetic parity, such as we see with new urbanism, or should it promote multicultural representation? such as Latino the urbanists try to do. Who should define urban culture? Should it be left completely to professionals and according to which standards? So I look forward to your questions and comments and I'm sorry for uh, the audio problem. <laughs>